So we've talked about sensory, uh, the sensory nervous system, or sensory part of the nervous system before. We've talked about cranial nerves. A lot of them have uh, sensory function. Some of them have motor function as well. Um, our, our senses are scattered throughout our body so that they can continually take uh, measurements from the external environment. Um, and it's, you know, it's not we have five senses, but in fact we have more senses than just five. Um, but the traditional ones we refer to are sight, hearing, uh, smell, taste, uh, and touch. Um, and people often say, oh, the sixth sense, you know, some sort of special thing they have, maybe it's a spider sense, maybe they see dead people. Um, but in reality, we have more senses. We can feel uh, pain, pressure. We can sense distance, movement. Um, some of those are, are secondary to these, these other senses. Um, but it's hard to actually kind of break down things into particular um, and definitive senses. For example, uh, both smell and taste are actually chemoreception just in uh, different, different receptors, but they're both just um, detecting chemicals in their abundance. So, but we'll talk about uh, sight, hearing, um, and you know, there are others that you can go in more detail in the book, but those ones we'll focus on for um, for our special senses. Uh, so we'll start with the eye. Uh, there are a lot of different parts of the eye. Um, and we'll go over these in more detail in lecture, but I'll briefly touch on them here. The sclera is the white part of the eye. It's made of connective tissue. It doesn't help you see. It's just a protective layer. The choroid is the middle layer of the eye. It is where light is absorbed and is the vascular layer, so where the uh, blood vessels are. Retina is the innermost layer of the eye. That's where the photoreceptors are, um, including bipolar cells and ganglia, neurons. The ciliary body is smooth muscle, controls the shape of the lens, also secretes fluid. Uh, the lens is uh, a flexible, transparent, biconcave discs disc um, and it changes shape so that you can see things far or close um, and it will adjust according to what you're trying to look at and focus on the iris is made of two smooth muscles um, two smooth muscle layers and it's the colored part of the eye um, it actually only has brown pigment but uh, the light diffracts off of it to show different colors and that changes um, in relation to how much light you want let in. The pupil is not really anything except an opening which is made by the iris. There's an optic disc where in the back of your eye where the optic nerve exits the eye and it's a big round part. It also creates a blind spot where you cannot see but because you have overlapping vision you don't notice it. The macula um, is the oval region in the posterior of the eye, so around that optic disc. And the fovea centralis then is the center of the macula, um, and it does not have retinal layers, so you get a more focal, concise picture from there. Um, the anterior chamber is filled with aqueous humor, so which is a fluid, and the posterior chamber is filled with vitreous humor. Well, here they all are on the figure. Um, you can match those up with the description um, in the previous slide. Um, so yeah, light goes into the pupil, which how much is controlled by that iris. Um, it is then diffracted through the lens. Okay, so there's the hole. There's the lens, which can change shape um, because of the ciliary body. Um, you have a chamber of fluid here and then a larger chamber of fluid behind it, posterior and anterior cavity, ca which contain aqueous and vitreous um, humor. 
In the back you have three layers here, the retina, choroid, and sclera. Retina with the photoreceptors. And here is the back then, where you have the optic nerve coming into the eye, and that's where the uh, blind spot is. Then there are muscles around the eye as well. The muscles control how the eye moves. You have one on top, one on the body. Bottom, the superior inferior rectus. You have two on the side, the lateral and medial rectus. And you have um, one that sweeps underneath and overneath uh, the inferior oblique and superior rectus. Sorry, superior oblique. And it has a little tendon which makes it wrap around. Okay, so those move the eye in many different directions. Um, what actually sends the signal to your um, neurons or to your central optic nerve are photoreceptors, and there are two types. Rods, rods don't give you a lot of definition, um, but they do help you with dark and light uh, definition. Um, it's, these are mostly concentrated in your peripheral vision, areas where you don't need to have acute um, contrasting images. Uh, rhodopsin is the pigment within these rods which reacts with the light to produce a neural stimulus. Uh, cones are for bright color vision and provide a lot more um, definition to the um, sight. And it has a lot more resolution. You have blue cones and red cones and green cones um, which will detect these different types of light, different wavelengths. If they are all being stimulated, then that is perceived as white light. And they work by changing shape when stimulated by the light, and then that creates an action potential. Okay, so that is all we're going to talk about for sight. Uh, the ear has three parts, external, middle, and internal part of the ear. The external ear uh, starts with the pinna, which is, you know, your ear, what you would refer to as your ear, with your earlobe, where you would get an earring or other piercings. It is made of elastic car cartilage. The lobule then is the earlobe. And the external acoustic meatus then is the hole which leads into your ear. Its purpose is to funnel sound into the middle and inner ear. So there are also things which can you know go inside of your ear um, and to prevent that you have uh, ceruminous glands which secrete a waxy substance co called cerumen which is your earwax um, yeah just to kind of like snot traps dirt um, keeps things from getting into your ear maybe repels insects a little bit um, and movements of the jaw then will cause cerumen to fall out on its own. Of course, you can also get in there and with a Q-tip or, or, or whatever to pull some out as well. They can compact the ear canal and prevent hearing as well. All right, the middle ear is made of the tympanic membrane. So what happens is a pressure wave is created. It funnels into the, to the external acoustic meatus, and then it causes this tympanic membrane to vibrate. And that then causes the malleus incus and stapes, the ear ossicles, to vibrate and propagate the sound. Uh, and they just simply act as levers so that when they move, they can you know, cause the sound to transmit in a more efficient way. Um, there is also a canal which connects to your nose called the phar pharyngotympanic uh, tube or the eustachian tube. And that helps you internal uh, uh, adjust pressure within your ear and uh, sinuses. And then there are connections then to the inner ear through the oval and round window. Okay, so then we get into the inner ear and you have a bony labyrinth and a membranous labyrinth. In the bony labyrinth, you have the vestibule, uh, cochlea, semicircular uh, canals. Okay, and these contain fluid paralymph, um, which is important for um, some other senses that you have, including balance. Uh, the membranous labyrinth is inside 
of the bone and that contains endolymph. So the way that hearing works, again, you have pressure waves created by things that move or make sounds um, that causes the tympanic membrane to vibrate the ear ossicles, transmit and amplify those vibrations to the oval window. That then causes fluid to be displaced and little hairs then move. Um, and those are attached to nerve endings, which then cause action potentials to send neural stimulation to the brain and the brain then makes sense of it and perceives it as sound okay so there's kind of all of the things um, in different steps happening there all right sound again is a perception by the brain um, which is produced by a vibrating object a frequency is the number of waves that pass through a given point in time. A high frequency has shorter waves, um, so it passes more points, more times in a, in, in a given time period. Low frequency are long waves and fewer passes. The human hearing range is um, 0 0.02 to 20 kilohertz, and that is a kilohertz is a um, is the unit of measure for frequency. We hear best between 1.5 and 4 kilohertz, but beyond 20 you cannot hear. But you lose, you start to lose those upper frequencies as you get older. The wavelength is the distance between two consecutive crests. The pitch is how we perceive different frequencies, you know, high pitch or low pitch. And the amplitude is how loud the sound is, and that will show up in the graph in a second. Decibels are the measurement of sound amplitudes or how loud something is. Normal conversation is 50 decibels, noisy restaurant 70. Greater than 90 can cause permanent damage to those cilia, those little hairs which attach to the nerves and thus hearing loss. Um, painful sound is around 120 decibels and that's about what concerts are, just on the threshold of pain. You do have a dampening effect if you are around um, sounds that are too loud for a long time um, and that will prevent you from hearing, hearing temporarily or prevent your hearing from being as sensitive temporarily um, but can result in permanent damage as well okay so you can kind of see here these are different wavelengths a high frequency wavelength is going to have lots of waves um, more waves than a low frequency wavelength and those will be perceived as a higher pitch and a lower pitch a lower sound um, and a higher sound um, but and then how big these waves are would be the amplitude that would be how loud it is all right there are lots of hearing conditions i talked about how uh, you could have uh, your ear canal blocked with earwax that would be a conduction deafness um, you can have infections in the ear uh, which then puts pressure on your tympanic membrane and can hurt really bad most common in kids but um, um, adults can get these too every once in a while uh, you can have that's called otitis media sensor sensorineural deafness which is damage to those neural structures so that can occur at those concerts you go to for too long where the if you don't wear earplugs or something. Um, cochlear implants can correct for this in severe cases. Tinnitus is ringing or clicking sound in your ears, even though nothing's going on. I've had this temporarily a few times, but luckily it goes away. Um, but it can be a side effect to medicine or inflammation or nerve damage. Vertigo, now this isn't a hearing condition. This is a, another condition which happens in the inner ear, but that's feeling dizzy or, or nauseous even when there's no neural stimuli to feel that way. Um, so this can be a, you know, a chronic condition or it could be the result of uh, some acute condition. All right, now we're gonna move on to the autonomic nervous system and then we'll be done with material video lectures for AMP1. Again, moving through our different um, sections of the nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is the visceral motor involuntary part of 
the efferent division of the peripheral nervous system. Okay, so we're going to be talking about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, in comparison, we, the autonomic nervous system uh, is our involuntary parts of our body, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. They have what's called pre and post ganglia. Remember, a ganglia is a group of gray matter within the peripheral nervous system. And so it has a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron. So something before the ganglion and after the ganglion. There are two neurotransmitters used in the autonomic nervous system, mostly norepinephrine and acetylcholine, which activates the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. In the somatic nervous system, they pretty much use only one neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. There's only one long nerve fiber, and generally myelinated, because you want those muscles to act quickly. So we don't have time to synapse at a ganglia. We just want to go straight to the muscle. The divisions of the parasympathetic nervous system, uh, which again is the rest and digest, um, it keeps our heart rate, breathing rate low, regulates digestion, defecation, urination. Um, so all that's part of the parasympathetic system. The nerves have craniosacral origin, so they're up here in the cranial part of the uh, spinal cord or in the sacral part of the spinal cord. And they have long preganglion axons and short postganglion. So long preganglion, short post. Uh, the terminal ganglia are generally right near the effectors. Okay, on the other side, uh, oh, I guess we'll go through these first. So the cranial section includes the oculomotor nerve, which is the third nerve, uh, the facial nerves, um, which is another cranial nerve, and the glossopharyngeal nerve. Um, and these uh, include the lacrimal gland, nasal gland, salivary gland. So that's what they are important for. All right, so these are what's activated when um, you are getting ready to eat. And even just the mention and you know, sight of food can cause these to affect, especially if you're hungry. So high calorie delicious foods like these might uh, enact a um, parasympathetic nervous system response through those um, salivary glands. The vagus nerve is the last one, uh, number 10 of the cranial nerves, and it is 90% of, um, of the input from the, of the cranial section, okay? Um, and it will affect the heart, lungs, esophagus, liver, gallbladder, stomach, small intestine, kidneys, large intestine. So all, pretty much all your visceral organs um, are innervated by this branches of the vagus nerve. In the sacral section, you have things in the lower part of the body, segments S2 to S4 in the spinal cords, and that uh, innervates the large intestine, urinary bladder, ureters, and re reproductive organs. All right, the sympathetic nervous system then occurs in the segments from T1 to L2. Um, these preganglia neurons make up the lateral horns in the spinal cord, so everything's actually really close to the spinal cord in this. And there's three ways in which they can synapse. They can be at the same level, okay? So the, the ganglia is right next to the spinal cord, or they can go at a higher or lower level. Here's one going to the higher level. Or they can go through distant collateral regions. So they may skip that and go down to a, um, another nerve, such as the splanchnic nerve which goes through chain ganglia and then synapses in a collateral ganglion. Okay? Um, if they synapse with uh, the trunk ganglia, this is where our, our um, um, structures that we learned about with the spinal cord come into to play. The preganglionic axons enter the white communicant uh, rami communicantes into the chain ganglia and then exit the gray communi uh, rami communicantes into the ventral or dorsal rami. And remember, the myelination makes them white or gray. Uh, makes them white, unmyelinated, makes them gray. 
So the signal would tra transfer, travel fastest in the white rami communicantes because it's myelinated. All right, synapses with trunk ganglia um, include those that emerge from T1 to T4 and go into the head, the eye, um, tear duct, some of the salivary glands. It uh, also goes to the skin, blood vessels, the eye, such as the pupils, nasal gland, and salivary glands, upper eyelid. Okay, the ones in the thorax, uh, spinal nerves T1 through T6, uh, go to the heart and the thyroid gland, the skin, the aorta, and the lungs, and the esophagus up to the larynx and the trachea there. Uh, the ones that form splanchnic nerves uh, include the greater, lesser, and least thoracic splanchnic nerves. Here we have, it's called the inferior mesenteric, um, so we can change that. Um, the lumbar, lumbar splanchnic nerves, sacral splanchnic nerves as well. And in the abdomen, they go from T5 to L2. Uh, and those innervate the stomach, intestines, liver, spleen, and kidneys. Um, the ones in the pelvis go from 10, T10 to L2, and those go through the lumbar and splanchnic, sacral splanchnic nerves, um, into the urinary bladder, reproductive organs, and large intestine. Um, and they also inhibit muscles of the abdominal pelvic area. Um, the third one here, there are some that go to the adrenal medulla, into the adrenal gland. Um, and that, when stimulated, that causes the adrenal gland to release norepinephrine and epinephrine, um, which then has a whole host of fight or flight mechanisms, which are, um, are then stimulated. All right, so there are a bunch of unique sympathetic um, nervous system functions, including thermal regulation, where the dilation of blood vessels allows for dissipation of heat and the stimulation of sweat glands. There is a process called uh, uh, a renin-angiotensin-aldosterone pathway, which regulates blood pressure, um, metabolism, so increasing your metabolic rate via uh, raising glucose levels in the blood or mobilizing fats for energy. Uh, skeletal muscle contraction, so to make that go faster and stronger, um, a sympathetic nervous system can activate the system for that. All right, uh, crying is another uh, sympathetic nervous system uh, action. And there is also another one, this is kind of like a special one, um, where I wanted to talk about this to highlight the what happens when you have a contradiction in your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So essentially what this is is when you are crying or emotional, but you're trying to not cry, okay, and that lump in your throat occurs, okay, and the reason that that occurs is when you are crying, that's a sympathetic nervous system response, right? And so uh, some sympathetic nervous system things which happen is fight or flight. It, the epiglottis is going to want to open up the air passageway so you can get more air into your lungs so you can have more um, energy available. But uh, if you are crying and emotional, you have salivary glands and nasal glands um, active and you want to swallow. Well, to swallow, you need that epiglottis to close. And so if you want to not cry, you're going to have a lot of attempted swallowing. And essentially that is going to contradict what the sympathetic nervous system is trying to do. And then it plays out as this kind of lump in your throat, this temporary pain there. Okay, and then that's it.